Are you on Instagram? If so, then please give Adventure Diaries a follow. The page is at Adventure Diaries underscore underscore or simply search Adventure Diaries Chris Watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram and I'll see you over there. Thank you. One of the reasons I think I love travel is I love learning new things and and then nothing quite focuses you and forces you in some ways to learn new things than getting out of your comfort zone and getting into some other environment. You know, whether it be adventure travel like you're focusing on or or just even, you know, regular travel whatever that is, uh, you know, just struggling sometimes with the with the ticket machine and the subway and Czech Republic in Merida for the for the festival eating one dollar street tacos while the local dancers were dancing and and then went down and you know climbed the pyramids in Ushmal and went into a cave and saw handprints from people from ten thousand years ago and it was fabulous. It was an amazing trip. And I appreciate when I am also inspired by people who I've had on the show. Uh, you, you know the joke they tell about Europe, right? The difference between heaven and hell? The, the difference between heaven and hell is in, in heaven, the British are the police and the Germans are the mechanics and the French are the cooks and the Italians are the lovers and the Swiss are the bankers. In hell, the British are the cooks... <laughs> The Germans are Welcome to the Adventure Diaries podcast, where we share tales of adventure, connection, and exploration. From the smallest of creators to the larger-than-life adventurers, we hope their stories inspire you to go create your own extraordinary adventures. And now your host, Chris Watson. Welcome to another episode of the Adventure Diaries. Today, we have an extra special guest. Chris Christensen, the host of the Amateur Traveller podcast. Since its inception in 2005, the Amateur Traveller podcast has amassed nearly 900 episodes and over 7 million downloads, an astounding achievement. And Chris joins us today to share his deep passion for travel and culture, as well as his podcasting journey and touching upon the community he has built along the way. We'll recount some of his most memorable trips and episodes, sharing invaluable travel recommendations, as well as reflecting on the recognition and awards the show has received to date, including an esteemed invitation to the Obama White House. Throughout our conversation, Chris offers insights into the enriching experiences of working and studying abroad, the critical role of learning and problem solving in travel, and the priceless value of cultural connections. So whether discussing the majestic canyons of the American West or the vibrant markets of Morocco, this discussion, along with Chris's own episodes and his own pod, promises to ignite your wanderlust. So settle in and enjoy this fantastic conversation with Chris Christensen, the host of the Amateur Traveller podcast. Good day, good morning. Hi, Chris Christensen. Welcome to the adventure diaries how are you thanks very much and uh, i'm i'm good thanks good 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 well thanks for joining you know i reached out i want to talk all things amateur traveler but before we kind of get into that i just wanted to hear a bit more about yourself and and what ignited your passion for travel and languages uh those are two separate answers of uh, for travel, it's actually a lot of the stuff behind you in your video here it was a lot of trips to national parks and things was where I did travel as a kid. I The only international travel I did until I was out of college was Canada uh, and that only to Western Canada. And it was typically to the national parks and we would travel with my family in an old uh, pulling a old 14 foot travel trailer and that was 14 foot if you counted the hitch so it was you know fairly small travel trailer for a family of of four Uh, but that was where i really learned to love travel and maps and all that sort of thing languages came later it came after i started doing more international travel so i was the kid who grew up in california in a city that was 50 percent hispanic and didn't want to learn spanish um, you know, it's like, what was the, what was the point of learning Spanish? Spanish was the language they spoke in the fields. That wasn't, that wasn't what I needed to know. 
And, you know, then, of course, later on, as an adult, you start traveling and you go, you know, they speak Spanish a lot of places. Uh, and so, you know, trying to learn the languages of places I went to, probably the most successful I had was I had a friend who said he was going to turn, I think it was 40, and he wanted to do it in a villa in Tuscany. And so he gave us uh, like six months notice. And so I spent a lot of time with learning the car Italian enough so that, you know, when we were traveling around Italy, I was able to have some some good interactions with people, not conversations really, but at least they understood that I had spent some time studying Italian. Yeah, I think it strikes up a little bit of a bond, doesn't it? If you even if it, yeah, yeah. you attempt it, the languages, I think it goes a goes a long way. I, I think I seen, I think when I was in Greece, I seen a sign that said, uh, uh, it was something to do with like ordering a coffee, and I, I, and it was like if you you order it in English, then it's like two dollars, but if you order it and then it was whatever the Greek was for for ordering a coffee, it was like half the price and stuff. And it was like the more <laughs> the more the language you use, the cheaper the price got. So, and that always that always struck with me. We had an experience in Milan where we went out to dinner one night, and the the waiter spoke English. They were young men, but I, you know, darn it, I had spent six months studying Italian, so I was going to order in Italian, and. You know, it was a fine meal and it was a good experience. But the next night we were going to go to someplace else, but they had a private party. We went, well, we had a nice meal at the other place. Let's go back there. And so we go back there and we walk in the door and Mama, who is, you know, the the, patri the matriarch of the restaurant, sees me walk in and says in Italian, oh, you're the one who was speaking Italian. And oh. we had a, a very different experience. We were family. We were... You know, we were treated differently. Um, and every time I looked over, she'd be looking at me and she'd be beaming because I had just taken the effort to learn a little Italian. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what it's all about. The more cultural immersion you can get, the, the better. It, it totally changes right. the trip, doesn't it? Yeah. Good. So, I mean, you've been podcasting since, what, 2005? Is that right? Uh, the Jurassic era, I believe, actually. Yes. Eight, eight <laughs> so, yeah, 2005, July 2nd. Wow. Well, 18 mean, plus years. Pretty much a stalwart of the industry. I mean, that is that is dedication. Well, is you know, you say that. The funny thing is I thought I was late to podcasting because yeah. podcasting was almost a year old by the time I started. It started in September of 2004. You know, yeah. and I didn't start till July of 2005, and I honestly yeah. felt like I was late to the game. I've actually uh, seen one of your uh, funny your tutorial <laughs> videos on how to use iTunes and set up a podcast and the interface on it, and it just looks like yeah. I mean, I've grew up in IT, and you know the yeah, yeah. evolution of the, the GUI and in, in the interface and stuff, and then looking at that, it, it just looks yeah. You know, it's hard to imagine that was you know, 18, 19, what, 20 years ago or something that iTunes came out? Oh, it's, yeah, it's it came out ago. two episodes into Amateur Traveler. Ah, wow. Okay. Right. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, I beat uh, iTunes into the podcasting space by just a couple weeks. Um, and actually one of the engineers who was on the, um, on the iTunes podcasting support used to work for me when I was a manager at Apple for four years. So. Ah, ah, so yeah, so touching on that then, so a bit similar to myself, so you work in IT then, you've worked in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. or are you still working or are you part-time or I have gone, I went back to work about a year before the pandemic and okay. um, it was hard that first year because I wasn't able to travel quite as much because I, I didn't have as much time off. I had been doing part-time contracting for mm -hmm. about six years. But as it turns out, during the pandemic, when we weren't traveling anyway, it uh, was a pretty good thing. So I was at a six-person startup company that last uh, June, or a year ago June, was bought by American Express. So I'm a director of engineering at American Express. Ah, so, excellent. Yeah. How, does that give you any travel perks? Because they also they sponsor no, a lot of all. the... No, not at all. Right, okay. no, no free I also worked at TripAdvisor in time out. No, not so much. Oh, God. <laughs> Go on. Excellent. So, how how do you find juggling, or I mean, juggling a job and a career through your time running a podcast? Because yeah, it must be quite exhausting different. often. <laughs> uh, so, I have you know, two active podcasts uh, down from four. I when I went back to work full time, I I did get off 
two podcasts that I was doing and two active blogs. And, uh, yeah, I go to, I go to sleep exhausted. Uh, <laughs> and I work, you know, most, most evenings is the honest answer. Uh, but yeah. you just get used to being motivated by deadlines. Yeah. Um, okay. so there've been a lot of, you know, Friday nights earlier on. Now I tend to do it a little earlier in the week where, you know, I'm, I would rather do something else, but I have to get the podcast out. Um, <clears throat> so I think so. Well, it's paying off. I think you, you've had quite a bit of recognition, haven't you, o over the time? I think you were voted best independent travel journalist by Traveling Leisure or Leisure magazine. Is that correct? Yeah, in uh, 2014. Uh, yeah. Largely because of one of the other podcasts that I am no longer doing. Uh, basically, Gary Arndt and I and Jen Leo started a podcast in 2009 that we did for 10 years called This Weekend Travel. And Gary's idea was that if we invited on the travel writers and the travel editors, we could get more visibility in that space. Mm -hmm. And we did. <laughs> and Gary won the best independent travel journalist in 2013, and I won it in 2014. <laughs> and we know that one of the judges had been a guest on the show, and that's where he had come across our work. So we weren't voted for that show. Uh, he was voted yeah. for his photography, and I was voted for for Amateur Traveler. But uh, it was because we had raised our visibility through that podcast. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and thoroughly well deserved. I think for for me, the the big draw to I think your brand and everything that you're doing is the community side of it. I think hearing some of the, like the first hand experiences, even from non natives that are living and immersing themselves in some of the you know some of the the regions, like the, the recent episode in, in Svalbard, and I think the Azerbaijan mm -hmm. one as well. You know, like non natives that are actually going there and living and then experiencing it. It's it's awesome. Mm -hmm. How how do you how do you find your engagement with the community? Is that, is that is, is that part of your drive? Does that excite you? We'll be back after a quick break. Are you on Instagram? If so, then please give Adventure Diaries a follow. The page is at Adventure Diaries underscore underscore or simply search Adventure Diaries Chris Watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram and I'll see you over there. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that I've been doing since 2010 is, uh, other than the years of the uh, pandemic, uh, actually doing a trip each year with people who are from the listener audience. Um, and that's been fun. Uh, that's a, It's a fun group of people. And, you know, and the very first time I did a meetup with the listeners of the show, it wasn't, wasn't a huge meetup. It was, I don't think, six people or something like that in 2009. Um, in Chicago. I happened to be going to Chicago for the first travel blogging conference, um, at least the first one I was aware of. And when I went to that, I put out the call and said, hey, I'm going to be in Chicago. Anybody want to come and have, have pizza, you know, have a slice of pizza at, uh, at Uno's or someplace like that. And um, what I was surprised is uh, people drove two or three hours, which was very surprising to me uh, because I've met me. So, you know, I, I'm less <laughs> impressed with me. And yeah. um, and so that was the first surprise. And the second surprise was I would start to tell a joke and they would laugh too soon because they knew my <laughs> jokes because I had to realize that they were friends that I'd never met. Uh, you know, they right. I had been in their ears for years. And so they knew me, but I did not know them. That must have been. So that was... Uh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. Must have been and at least cool. two of the people, one of the couples from that group, actually, I've now traveled with to uh, Egypt on the very first amateur traveler trip. So, and still keep in touch with some of the people from that meetup uh, back in 2009. So. Oh, that's incredible. I, I mean, that, pretty, that is pretty quite fun group. inspirational. Yeah. And that's part of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I mean, mine's is probably more focused on some of the adventure space as well and i think just the, trying to mm -hmm. build that community and connection and some of these trips that we go on and trying to to, to build a bit more kind of relationship with, with some of those uh, you know those guides and those you don't think the road trip across kansas fits into adventure travel 
<laughs> yeah, well, we'll co- we'll come on we'll come on to that. We, actually. we do we do both. We do uh, a a broad variety of trips. Uh, you know, certainly, yeah. the going to Tonga and swimming with whales will count that as adventure travel. But uh, yeah, well, yes. In fact, I mean, let's let's jump into that then. So, give us some of the, your best your best trips. Then, don't give us a recommendation yet. We'll come uh, to best, that. Best uh, episodes yeah. of amateur travel or best uh, trips that I have personally done, or both. Let's do one of each. So the best okay. trip that you have done. Um, let's do a best episode that turned into one of my best trips. How's that? We can we okay. can yep. hit uh, yep. two birds with this stone. So we had on way back in the archives a, a guest who is a travel writer, Zora, Orne- Zora O'Neill. And she came on a couple times talking about New Mexico, but she did a, an episode uh, early on of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And, you know, she said, in addition to going to, you know, don't worry about Cancun. Cancun's just you know, U.S. South. It's it's not a great way to inter- interact with locals or whatever. And, yeah, you should go to Chichen Itza. But she also took us, for instance, over to Merida. Um, for the fiesta on Sunday afternoons and then go down to the Rue de Pouc, which is a mo- set of Mayan ruins and a cave with 10,000-year-old Mayan, uh, well, Mayan, uh, pre-Mayan, I guess, uh, cave art. And it just was, we then, I wanted to do that trip. <laughs> it, we put it off for a few years, but we eventually did the trip that she had suggested and, you know, skipped Cancun, stayed in Playa del Carmen, but also were in Merida for the for the festival eating one dollar street tacos while the local dancers were dancing and and then went down and you know climbed the pyramids in Ushmal and went into a cave and saw handprints from people from ten thousand years ago and it was fabulous. It was an amazing trip. And I appreciate when I am also inspired by people who I've had on the show. And that was definitely one that is memorable to me. Yeah, that's incredible. So, what episode was that again, Chris? Are you, can you? Oh gosh, you uh, yeah. I'll search uh, it. I can find it. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I, it'll, yeah, it's something I'll, I'll I'll listen to afterwards and also link to in, in the show notes for this. Yeah, strangely, but you know, my, my family and I we were due to go to, to Mexico when when the pandemic hit, and it's one of those trips that's been postponed countless times. Yeah, I've been to Ch- Chichen Itza. That I've was that. episode 163. 163. Excellent. Way, way back in the archives. Yeah. So in terms of a trip then that you, you, you've you done that you haven't spoken about necessarily, or haven't podcasted about, what would you hmm. what would be... What would be up there with some of the best? Well, for your audience, let's think adventure. Um, I don't think I have podcasted about... So I had uh, years ago, the person who started the whitewater rafting company, Oars, on the show. And so they do a lot of whitewater rafting, predominantly in the US, but also elsewhere in the world. And he came on and talked about a week-long trip down the Grand Canyon. And... I, you know, I was a fabulous uh, episode, and I, one of the things I asked him is if you can't get on to that because it's it you have to book years in advance to get on a Grand Canyon trip. Is there a second place you would go? Is there a shorter trip or something else that you recommend? And he recommended the Gates of uh, Lador, Lador, yeah, in um, in Dinosaur National Monument in Colorado, and. Then sponsored me, then basically invited me to come on that trip with oars. And it's a three-day whitewater rafting trip. And basically, when you head out from the place where you put in until you basically come out again, you're in the canyon and it's nothing but river and canyon. And and there's no roads and there's no towns or anything like that. Uh, And it's whitewater. And, you know, at times it's it's uh, rowing against the wind, whipping down yeah. the canyon, and you're seeing <laughs> billion, you know, millions of billions of years of geological formations, uh, yeah. you know, on the yeah. the canyon walls here as you're going through this. And it was a fabulous trip, and I haven't even blogged about it as much as I had 
planned because I never quite got the photos from the people from the rest of the trip. We all were like the guide was going to uh, arrange to get us each other's photos. And I have no photos of me on the river, for instance, because I was going to get them from my people traveling with. And somehow that got messed up and we just never exchanged photos. But it was a, you know, still an amazing trip both in the rafts and in the inflatable kayaks on the, the green river yeah. and oh, the, wow. the gates of the I think sometimes and, and, and there is, in, uh, yeah, there, yeah. Are, there is something about, I think not always capturing everything. I think, I mean, I think even part of your manifesto, I think I recall you've got a point in there about you know, look up <laughs> from the viewfinder, haven't you? And I think that's quite important as well. Sometimes not yeah, to yeah. over document and over record everything. So it's good to kind of keep stuff in here and, and in here at times as well. Yeah. Had you done any whitewater rafting before? A bit harder when you when you know you're going to have to write about it, or, or you know you're going to have well, a podcast true. about it. Yeah. True, <laughs> true. So, have you done any whitewater rafting before, or kayaking? Is is that anything that you that you're familiar with? Oh, sure. Yeah, I first did whitewater rafting probably in the Rogue River in Oregon, but I've done it in the American River in uh, California, and then also in the Pequari in. Costa Rica and probably some other ones that I'm forgetting about, but those are, those are some of the memorable ones. One of the okay. patrons of the show who we do a patron zoom call and he's always traveling to some part of the world to do whitewater rafting. And he's okay. been, you know, his, his trips uh, uh, are uh, more impressive than mine. I'd say in terms of where he has whitewater rafting, but yeah. it's on my list. Uh, awesome. I, I'm not a whitewater person yet yeah, as something I'm planning to do. So I do more kind of mm-hmm. sheltered water a little bit, like, well, locks as we call them over here as opposed to lakes. Mm-hmm. So a lot of more sheltered and, and maybe coastal waters at times as well. But yeah, we've got a, a friend in mine, of mine, him and I, we're actually going through like training and accreditation to become like uh, kind of tours and expedition leaders on, on water. So what, once mm-hmm. you get that, I plan to do a bit more in, in white water. And I think Colorado and places like that are definitely on the, on the cards yeah you've been yeah. in fact looking at some of the trips that you've been to you had i believe you'd been to new york i can't even pronounce this this is terrible the new york fjord in norway in bergen so i think you had visited the fjords hadn't mm-hmm. you sure yeah yeah what did you yeah, think up of that? in the fjord land yeah oh it's fabulous a uh, beautiful scenery uh one of the you know, it's it's hard to say, you know, one of the most beautiful places in the world, but there are a lot of them <laughs> in my <laughs> yeah. experience, but, but it is a gorgeous, gorgeous region. Yeah. yeah I did that on a, on a cruise ship uh, that was on yeah. a Viking uh, ocean cruise, but yeah. uh, fabulous scenery up there. Yeah. We, we kayaked it almost a year ago to this weekend, actually, my, my friend and I, which was, uh-huh which was interesting. I think we had a few of the cruise ships coming through when we were kayaking a fair distance away, but the swell would catch you like about yeah, 10 minutes after. I could well imagine. <laughs> that had passed. It was, yeah, that was a bit of an interesting experience. So, so what, what about, I mean, travel, there's always something that goes wrong, isn't there? There's always an, an experience. Have you had any dodgy, weird, strange, bad experiences? You know, I, you I saw that question in your list of questions, <laughs> and it's one that it's really funny because people are like, what's your best, you know, your funniest travel uh, disaster story or whatever? And I don't know that I have one. I mean, I had little things go wrong. Um, I think of on the um, amateur traveler trip we did to India, one of the things we did, it, there was a night train that was involved mm-hmm. going from New Delhi to Varanasi. Um, and if you haven't been to Varanasi, it's a fascinating place. It's on the Ganges River, and mm-hmm. it's where people take their loved ones to cremate them because they believe it's okay. a holy river. And there's holy men and holy cows, and don't step in the holy you know <laughs> thing the cow left behind. And, mm-hmm. uh, it, you know, fascinating place. Uh, but when we went to go from there to Agra then to Taj Mahal. We took another night train, um, second, second class air conditioning. There's, you know, this is, you're on a train with like (laughs) literally a thousand people, at least, I don't know how many cars on these things. And so we're in the, you know, not quite, uh, first class, uh, commendations, but you know, you have your sleeper bunks and things like that. And it's not uncomfortable, but it's, 
it's uh, a little more interesting, a little more adventurous. And we woke up and I, I woke up in the morning. I thought, okay, we should be almost in Agra according to our schedule. And we were not even halfway. And the way the, the Indian train system works is they get penalized for how many trains are late. And so if your train is late, they're going to choose your train to be later rather than some other train being late because it would be worse <laughs> for them to have two trains being late. <laughs> and so when you get late, you get later and later oh, yeah. and later. And so we got in just hours after we were supposed to, wow. because we just had no priority at some point. So you're just yeah. sitting on the train, you know, watching your uh, map slowly, slowly creep towards uh, Agra. It actually screwed up our schedule a little bit. We never did get to the red fort. We didn't have time, but, uh, you know, you, there's not much you can do about it. You're sitting there and the chai lossy vendor, or the chai vendor rather is coming around periodically selling you a cup of chai and you just uh, take it in stride. But don't have a lot of, you know, real disaster stories, I would say. Can I ask a favor? If you're enjoying the show, can you give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel on YouTube? And if you happen to be listening to the audio only version, can you give us a follow along there too? really help grow the channel. We've got some fantastic guests coming up with some truly inspirational stories. Now, let's get back to this episode. Thank you. I mean, strangely, I've asked this question to a few people and I mean, even my own travels, I haven't really had much bad experiences either. I've had the odd thing, you know, but nothing nothing major. In fact, this week, actually traveling for, for business, I, I was in Brussels for a couple of days and, and it was a 24 hour trip uh, trip to, just in and out for a business meeting i was del- my flight was cancelled on the way out i was i was diverted to dublin which is in the opposite direction i stayed 6 to 7 hours in the airport <laughs> and then when i got in uh, i checked into the hotel and as i walked into the room there was two italian pensioners in my bed so and, I was, <laughs> and they got up, got very angry, and ch- 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 chased me out the door. So yeah, that, and then I got delayed in, on the way back because my flight got cancelled. So that, but that was more business. Yeah, it was frustrating more than more than anything else. But it was a bit odd. Yep, I've, I've had those experiences, <laughs> including the one where they give us the hotel room with the people sleeping in it, and I've got my five-year-old son with us who is now sobbing because it's midnight yeah. and he's exhausted and we're never going to find a place to sleep. <laughs> so, which wasn't true, fortunately, but yeah, you'll have those moments. You have your, your moment where you've traveled to England, to London with your wife who is six months pregnant and your son who is um, about a year old or so. And your every single elevator and escalator that you've tried to use that day has been broken <laughs> and you're and finally you're under the thames and your wife is sobbing saying she can't go on which of course she is doing because she's under the thames and there is no option you can't call a cab um so you know you get to the other side you take her to tea and then you put her on a bus and send her back to the flat yeah but um <laughs> you you have those moments what, yeah, so you've been to the UK, I see, but I see that you have not been to Scotland. Yep. Is that correct? I have not been to Scotland, it is true. It is my great embarrassment. Yeah, well, I formally <laughs> invite you. There's a lot of other countries I haven't been to, but Scotland yeah. is the one in, in Western Europe that I haven't been to. Yeah. Well, if you're ever in this country, give me a shout and I will I will personally show you the the wonders of the the Trossachs, the Loch Lomond, not just Edinburgh where everyone tends to go. So that is also beautiful, but there are there are better and better places in my opinion. And I am biased because I'm from the the city across the way. What what do you make of the, the food and the culture in in the UK compared to to everywhere else you try because everyone always moans about the food being terrible and the, the weather <laughs> being terrible but what do, what do you think well you you know the joke they tell about europe right <laughs> the difference between that. heaven and hell <laughs> the, the difference between heaven and hell is in in heaven the british are the police and the germans are the mechanics and the french are the cooks and the Italians are the lovers and the Swiss are the bankers. <laughs> in hell, the British are the cooks, 
The Germans are the police. (laughs) The Italians are the mechanics. The French are the bankers and the Swiss are the lovers. So, you know, there, there are things we love about all of those countries. And then there are things that they don't do quite as well as some of their neighbors. I mean, that's, that's the thing I like about that joke is there's enough truth to it to be funny, but it means, you know, there are, you, you enjoy the food in Italy, but you don't expect the trains in Southern Italy, especially to run on time as much. Right. It's, it's, it's different, you know, As, 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 if I'm in Italy, if I'm in the UK, do I go to Indian food? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll actually, be, I think that in in all honesty, I think the food has gotten so much better in my experiences in the UK, especially the London area, which is where I've spent more time because I worked for a while for Time Out London. Um, yeah, okay. Than it was, you know, twenty, thirty years ago, or so. I think mm-hmm. there's a lot more. Um, quality food you know the the traditional food in england is not necessarily my favorite but uh you know i think there's so much variety of food and that the food scene is i think i think london's a food city now oh that's amazing so. i mean i think a lot of metropolitan or large cities in the uk there's a lot of kind of migration and, and there's a lot of culture cultural diversity which is which is yeah. which is excellent and i think yeah, the, exactly the food, even my own city i, I would say that well, maybe 10 15 20 years ago glasgow was yeah you know, I, I wouldn't say it would be a place to really you know be shouting about the dining and stuff but now there's yeah there's there's new even from like not like high-end restaurants but even just like cafes and smaller you know uh solo yep. run enterprises there are some phenomenal foods and, and and eating places in this in this city and yeah L- london is yeah is is phenomenal uh, yeah. so on the on the topic yeah we've food, seen that in in the us as well a lot more um the foodie culture while i'm not necessarily a foodie per se you know and and i don't do what i've had a coworker do when i worked at uh, tripadvisor plan his trip to hit you know all the Michelin star restaurants in an area. This, that is not me. I give me the, give me the cheap <laughs> dive or someplace yeah, like that. Exactly. But, I, but yeah. I think the food scene in so many places has gotten better. So, yeah. yeah. How do you avoid the tourist traps when you go to a, you know, a city or a country then? You know, if you, do you have food on your mind when you play? Cause I, I do. First of all, do I, do I avoid the tourist traps? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I, I don't always avoid the tourist traps. Uh, somewhat intentionally, somewhat unintentionally. I mean, there, there's places in, you know, when you go to Paris, you see the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. You know, you you go to the Louvre. Uh, there are places that you're going to go that are popular and they're popular for a reason. Um, but I think then trying to discover then some of the other spots that you don't hear about um, or the other city nearby that you don't hear about, I think is is what, for instance, what we try and do on the on the show yeah. So it's not to say, you know, you shouldn't go to, you know, the Tower of London when you're in London, but hey, have you heard about that little museum down the way or, you know, yeah. what did the locals do that's that's an interesting thing to to really discover the city, I think is the thing that I'm trying to get at in the different yeah. episodes we're doing. Yeah, excellent. I mean, you do feel compelled to see. It's like going to, you know, yeah, like you say, London or, or New York. You're compelled to see the, you know, the the big ticket items and just to, you know, because I've been, like, I'd been to New York as an example countless times before I had ever been with my wife, and then when we went the first time together, you, you're having to check off like the Empire State Building and all, and all the things that you've kind of seen before, and there's an there's an element right. of grimacing in doing that, but it's. But yeah, you feel like you're compelled to do it, and then although you, can get back you to can't it. beat the view from the Empire State Building, yeah. it, it is a it is a great view. It's it's expensive um, yeah. for what you get, but you know, so you know, you want to also know what's what's the bar that you can get a drink at, yeah. and for the same price, and and get almost as good a view or something like that. Yeah. But um, you know, and I, I've done the Circle Line tour in New York, which is a very classic thing. But it's a great, you know, it's a boat ride around yeah. the city. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. What I haven't been to yet, what I'm hoping to get to when I'm in New York in September, is the uh, Tenement Museum, for instance, mm-hmm. that has more of the history of things like that. Um, mm-hmm. So there are places that I think are are undiscovered, even within well discovered destinations. Yeah, awesome. 
Awesome. Well, so actually going back to food, what what is, yeah, do you do you do you get recommendations from like your community and stuff when you're going places? Do they give you suggestions on restaurants? Because I, I think Oh, I don't it. usually ask. <laughs> no, do you not? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think, no, I'm you know, honestly, we're we're often just looking at Yelp or TripAdvisor for recommendations yeah. or, you know, probably some of the best recommendations we had are following our nose. Um, yeah. I think of when we drove cross country when we were younger and we were fi- found a restaurant in the Grand Tetons in Jackson Hill, Wyoming, and literally we're walking around town going, what am I smelling? Where is that coming uh, from? <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I don't tend to uh, probably because I'm not a foodie as much because I, okay. I enjoy the the brew pub as well as the Michelin star restaurant or things like that. I'm, I probably don't reach out to the community that often and say, you know, where should I eat while I, while I'm here? Um, because I'm probably going to enjoy what I'm eating anyway. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, t- I tend to, I tend to focus my travels around food, which is a bit odd. And it's to my wife's frustration and my little girl's <laughs> frustration as well. So I always try and plot an adventure or something, but it's all, there's all, it's always, but it's not a Michelin star. I, I can't, I, I don't like fussy food. I don't like that type of stuff, but I do like to, right, right. like you said about the, like, the, the Italian experience and being in, you know, the, the nonna or the, the, the mama, like going to these mm-hmm. back, you know, tri- uh, trattorias or, or whatever. And, you know, the, you know, whether it's somewhere in Tuscany, th- things like that. I like to, I like to seek that out, which is good. When I'm traveling with my wife, I plan my trip around food just in the sense that when you're finishing this meal, you have to figure out when she's going to get her next meal just so we don't get hangry here. So, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, if I'm traveling by myself a little, you know, I'm I'm the guy who you know when we were when I flew into Delhi for instance for the amateur traveler trip I just went around the corner to the first hole in the wall place yeah. uh you know not at all probably not at all looking for food safety even or anything like that just where are the locals eating what what yeah. can I get awesome. uh, I tell you the chicken biryani was good but boy was that spicy yeah. <laughs> couldn't even finish <laughs> yes. it. So. excellent awesome. awesome and I so, like spicy but you know yeah. that was serious yeah what's what's the food like where you are so so where where are you living at the minute chris you're in california so i live in san jose california yep so heart of silicon valley uh, because we are an area that is very diverse we have more passports per capita than any other place in the u.s because we have a lot of people who've come in to work in silicon valley as you might imagine and then we have very large uh, second largest Vietnamese community outside of Vietnam, uh, just up the ways, the one of the largest uh, Afghan communities outside of Afghanistan, little Kabul in, in Fremont, California. And so because of that, we have great ethnic food um, in, you know, of various types. There's a, a South Indian restaurant I know that's up here a couple miles that doesn't have any English on the signs at all outside. <laughs> so like <laughs> they're not even trying to advertise in English. And I've been there and it's 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 good food. But you know, obviously we can get great Mexican foods, good Hispanic community here. But on the other hand, I can I can get good barbecue and there's some, mm-hmm. you know, good brew pub scene, good wineries in the area. So good food scene here. Uh, California cuisine tends to be a fusion cuisine, uh, yeah. very uh, Asian influenced as well because of, you know, my neighborhood right where I'm sitting is 80% Chinese. Um, okay. Most of, you know, most of the people who are live in my neighborhood are engineers in some high tech firm. My daughter says, well, I used to say that she was eight before she realized that not everybody's dad was a software engineer. And she said, oh, no, no I was in junior <laughs> high. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, very good uh, Japanese, Chinese, even some Russian food. Not that yeah. Russian food is my favorite, but I can think of a Russian restaurant yeah. that I could, you know, a stone's throw away or whatever. So, so a lot of different variety of food here. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So can I, coming back to some of the, the work that you've done with the Amateur Traveller and, and some of the recognitions and awards. Mm-hmm. I did pick up that you had been invited to the Obama White House. Is that is that correct? Yes. 
Uh, also, uh, strangely enough, in 2014, the same year as the Smitty Award and the Little Thomas Award, uh, they did a, a travel blogger summit. They invited 100 travel bloggers in. Uh, it was a, actually a great time just to see some of the people that I had known online uh, in person for the first time or to meet some of the people up with people in in the city. And so they really wanted to promote people studying abroad. I would say the vast majority of the people who were there had studied abroad. A lot of them had studied abroad and gone into travel blogging after that or travel writing. Um, I had not, but my daughter had. Uh, we'd you know sponsored my daughter to study abroad at that point. So it was great fun. I, I also was able to interview the head of the U.S. Peace Corps after that uh, particular uh, event wow. because I met her there. So yeah. it was an interesting event, uh, all all on our own dime, right? They, when you're yeah. invited to the White House, <laughs> they figure it's an honor. They don't pay your way or anything yes. like that, but yeah. uh, but good fun. Enough. Yeah, fair enough. So what, what? So did you say is your daughter now? Is she, is she studying abroad or working in the travel space? She did. She's she she's did, now in yeah. her thirties. So oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what advice would you give for people that are planning to work, study abroad or, or even get involved in the, the travel spaces or things that you would do differently or advise people <laughs> to, to be mindful of? Yeah. One of the reasons I think I love travel is I love learning new things and, and mm-hmm. then nothing quite focuses you and forces you in some ways to learn new things than getting out of your comfort zone and getting into mm-hmm. some other environment, you know, whether it be adventure travel, like you're focusing mm-hmm. on or, or just even, you know, regular travel, whatever that is, uh, you know, just f- struggling sometimes with the, with the ticket machine and the subway and Czech Republic. It's a, it's problem solving things or, you know, using that little bit you, that you remember of the Chinese characters to realize that the subway in Tokyo, that you're that character, not that character, that you're an adult, (laughs) not a child. Uh, You know, it's, uh, it's a challenging puzzle sometimes to, to be able to get around and communicate and all of those things. But it also gives you a chance to learn things and see things from another point of view. And and the reason why the Obama White House was really trying to get people to travel is that their approach is that if we had more people who had connections in other countries, just informal, you know, friendships, that mm-hmm. that is good for the country. Because for one thing, you're bringing back, you're you're opening up your ideas and your and your minds to other ways that things might work. But you're also making these connections, and you're basically an informal diplomat for the country and and a good traveler, someone who is not the ugly American, for instance, is yeah. <laughs> you know can be a good representative of the country and help mm-hmm. foster good relations. Obviously, if you're out there, you know, uh, and you're the person who uh, is privileged and uh, just a little hard to get along with. You're not so much a good representative for your country, yeah. but you know, I think a lot yeah, of yeah. our study abroad students are flexible and young enough to, yeah. to be a good so representative. Was, so was the idea behind that, that you would be promoting like the U S and travel within the U S what, what was the kind of framework for, for that? Not for that one. That was really the encourage young Americans to leave the country for some period of time and travel and that travel study abroad is a real good opportunity to, to do that. Ah, oh, excellent. Yeah. Cause, cause not a lot of Americans actually have passports, do they? I mean, I mean, look at the size and the scale of the U S I, I can't remember the statistic. Well, that is true, but yeah, you can travel quite far without, without a passport here. Is <laughs> one of the reasons. Yeah. So, you know, I could get in the car and drive 3000 miles due East and yeah. not need a passport. So, yeah, um, true. that is, you know, one of the reasons why we don't have passports, but, uh, but yeah, it's true. And then also we didn't used to need passports to get into Canada or Mexico. You do now. Um, and so some of our passport. international travel. Yeah. You need a passport for Canada. Yeah. You didn't you? used to. Wow. Okay. You, you wow. do now. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, so it's... a lot of the travel that Americans had done did not require passports. You know, you really needed to get to Europe or, or Asia mm-hmm. or Africa to, to need a passport back in the yeah. day, you know, not all I that long the, ago. The U.S. absolutely dwarfs 
Europe, doesn't it? I mean, you could fit Europe into, into the US and still have room to, to wiggle about. It is. No, I'd say it's a similar size, uh, yeah. but it's, you know, it's it's fairly big. I think, you know, you end up with like France is the size of Texas or maybe it's a little bigger than yeah. that. But, you know, you're yeah. one of your larger countries. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's there are some, especially out here in the West, there's some wide open spaces. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, so, and some so what, what, amazing national parks. Yeah. I was going to say, what what is your favourite national park? What, so, how much? I'm assuming you've well, I, well, I know you've done a lot of travel in in the US. So, what top yeah. three? Give me give me your top three suggestions. If I was to come to the US looking for adventure, in fact, I'm, I'm looking for adventure. Actually. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, I've I've done a fair amount of travel in the US. I have been to every state. Um, my favorite national parks tend to be the Western parts. Um, probably my favorite national park just for scenic beauty is Bryce Canyon National Park, uh, which has the, it, which is not a canyon, uh, <laughs> the, the rather poorly named. It's actually a mesa with these uh, rock spires, these red hoodoo uh, that are uh, basically sandstone with a, 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 uh, dolomite cap uh, that has caused them to erode in the the fashion that they did. Um, Grand Canyon is also just, you know, stunning. Uh, it is a singular national park, a little harder for, you know, you really have to get very serious to get adventure in Grand Canyon, for instance, where if you want to do a rafting tour, you have to plan a year in advance. If you want to do a hike, that's a real serious hike. And, and Bryce is a little more just, uh, easy. You can basically do like the Navajo trail and hike down into the hoodoos and into slot canyons and things. And it's something that you don't have to be in the best of shape to do. It, you, it is, you know, a little more challenging if you're not in, in great shape, but it's um, a fascinating national park. Um, adventure nearby actually, and also in Utah. So Bryce is in the uh, state of Utah is Zion national park and hiking up the narrows in Zion is a fun experience. It's you're basically hiking in a slot Canyon. So you're hiking in the river. Uh, at first you're hiking in the, in the trails along the river. And at some point the trails go away because the Canyon closes in on you. And now it's 20 feet from wall to wall and 2000 feet high above you. And you have checked the weather report before you go in to make sure there are no flash floods coming. There's no rain uh, upstream from where you are. And you can do that as a two day hike. I've done the only the the one day up and back to the to the Nero's uh, portion of the canyon, but that's a fun one of the better hikes that I've done in the U.S. For instance, and then uh, adventure, adventure. I'm trying to think of what uh, would be some of the I, I'm. I was going to go out. How about North America and and leave U.S. for just a second and, and mention yeah, our northern also. neighbors who are also yes. worth a visit. <laughs> um, I've yeah. done a, a visit to um, Whitehorse Yukon. Um, and one of the things I did in my visit to Whitehorse Yukon is I did a, a plane ride over the ice fields nearby, which are one of the largest non-polar ice fields in the U.S., either first or second compared to Chile. <laughs> there's There's some there's some argument over who has the larger ice fields there, but we did, we landed on a glacier in a plane. So ah, wow. the plane has skis wow. and we, we actually landed and took off again from the glacier. And, wow. uh, you know, even if you don't get to land and most planes don't, uh, they yeah. have only had, when I was there, only a hundred people had been able to land on the glacier in the plane just because yeah. of weather and things like that going yeah. on. Just that view, that small plane wow. ride over the ice fields was amazing. But then having the bonus thing of being able to actually, you know, taxi down a, a glacier and take off again. Um, one of the things that surprised me, I, I guess I should have thought about it is how smooth that landing was, but you're, you're landing on snow and yeah. it was, was just it. the I, I, smoothest I, landing you can ever imagine. Yeah, I, I didn't even know that was a thing. I've never seen, I've never seen that like with yeah, skis yeah. and stuff like that. That's yeah, that's phenomenal. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Very that's cool. Right, up, yeah, right up my my street. So, uh, so we're we're almost kind of closing on time, Chris, and I want you to be respectful okay. of your time. So, 
I think we have covered I could talk a lot. for hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, could, so, so could I actually. I think, in fact, we, we might do a follow up in, in time if you were up, were up to it because there's some things that I. I'm going to go and scurry away and look at on YouTube and episodes I'm going to listen to and I may, may come back. So we've got some ideas. But we... <laughs> Be glad so, to do that. Yeah. So closing traditions that I've got in this show. So, and we may have touched on some of this already, but the, the first tradition is a call to adventure. So that's your opportunity to, to give sure. us a recommendation, a suggestion of activity or a place. And we've covered a lot, so... If, if we go over old ground, then so be it. But what would you recommend? What have you got for well, us? How, how about an invitation? Um, if you're interested in, in adventure, mm -hmm. um, soft adventure. So this yeah. is not ice climbing, for instance, mm -hmm. but uh, the adventure of seeing a different place. One of the trips that we have done uh, that my wife and I did that she said was her favorite trip ever, even though she got sick halfway through, uh, was Morocco. Uh, just because oh. from day to day, she couldn't tell what century she was in. And I'm actually taking a, a group to Morocco and there are spaces on that next April. So if you're interested, go to amateurtraveler.com slash trips and, uh, and join me in, in Fez and in Northern Morocco. The last time we did Southern Morocco. So it's be fun. Thank you. Yes, I will check that out. Co coincidentally, I'm, I'm actually reading a book at the moment called uh, The Caliph's House, which is based in Morocco. It's based more in uh, in uh, Casablanca, uh, and I'm I'm talking okay. to the author. We're, we'll be uh, in Casablanca in this trip, so yeah. Oh, Very excellent! Cool. Right, I'll yeah. So I'll double check uh, availability, and I uh, yeah, that is I I thank you for that. That's yeah, quite serendipitous. That's. Uh, yeah, that, that, I think reading that book, it's quite. It just it conjures up all sorts. I've never been. To, I've been to. Uh, I've been to Tunisia. I've done the Sahara, but I, I've never been into mm -hmm. to, to Morocco. I haven't just done thoughts. Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a that was a great experience. Yeah, when actually someone tried to, and it, this is not a joke. Someone tried to uh, exchange my wife for a, ca a camel when we were in the desert. They were offering me camels for my wife. <laughs> uh, honestly. Uh, I, I didn't know if it was a joke, I, but I think it was uh, semi-serious. Had a friend who, when she was 16, her mother was offered 16 camels for her. <laughs> and um, But the problem was that that was all the man had. So at that point, they wouldn't really have had something to live on. So it, it wasn't all practical. <laughs> so so oh, she, said, wow. she said no. But. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. So, uh, and finally, the, the closing segment is so pay it forward. So, this is our segment about raising awareness for good causes, for charities, or, or what, anything that's important that, that you would want to to spread the word on. So, what have you what have you got? So, in terms of things that would make sense for your audience, the I had, had a hard time picking between different projects that we have supported. Uh, Doctors Without Borders is one that I that I'm ah. fond of, uh, just because of the work that they do. And my wife works in healthcare, so she knows you know some of the doctors that she works mm -hmm. with. Uh, that is their charity. That is what they do in their off time as they go down to these um, places where healthcare is not as readily available and volunteer their mm -hmm. time for that. So uh, that's a definitely a worthwhile cause. Excellent. So Doctors Without Borders. Great. So we'll package all of that up in the show notes and yeah, get get that shared. Excellent. Yeah, I've thoroughly enjoyed this, Chris. This is, is yeah, there's yeah, like like you, I could probably talk for hours. There's so many things jumping around in my head at the minute. I want to, to come back. Yeah, to, you'd but... never invite a podcaster if you <laughs> want to do a short show. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Uh, no, thank thank you again. And, and if I if I didn't have to go and cook steaks for tea, and I, I would probably hang around for a little bit longer. But thank you again. I, I hope you. It was really nice to meet you. Thanks uh, for having me. For, yeah, and uh, I wish you a good weekend uh, and happy travels, and and I'll, I'll be in touch for sure. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. For the show notes and further information, please visit adventurediaries.com slash podcast. And finally, we hope to have inspired you to take action and plan your next adventure, big or small. 
because sometimes we all need a little adventure to cleanse that bitter taste of life from the soul. Until next time, have fun and keep paying it forward. Are you on Instagram? If so, then please give Adventure Diaries a follow. The page is at Adventure Diaries underscore underscore or simply search Adventure Diaries Chris Watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram and I'll see you over there. Thank you.